the picture. So, hi everybody, I'm delighted to be here and thanks for the introduction, Maria. So, yeah, my name's Karen Nolan, I'm from Ireland and I teach creative media at Dundalk Institute of Technology and recently finished up my PhD looking at arcade video games from mid 80s, late 90s. And I started off on the Digital Arts in the 90s program and it, so the kind of starting point was to, you know, use digital art as a way of, of exploring this medium as a connective and aesthetic um, material. And, you know, along that path, got into, you know, obviously looking at the platforms, you end up looking at the history, you end up looking at the technical side, and also then I had my sort of artifact strand to that as well. So I'll talk a little bit about, um, sorry, I'll adjust my mic. That's maybe a little better? Yeah, awesome, okay. So, yeah, so there's a lot of little things there that I kind of had to tie the threads off together, but yeah, we got there, and I'm what, submitting the final revised version next week. Fingers crossed. So yeah, this is it. Um, a little snippet of some of that work. And also, um, sort of as a hobby thing, along the side, the last couple of years, I did get hold of a couple of old arcade cabinets now they're still in a sort of a disrepaired state. But I was able to learn a little bit um, from, you know, trying to find out how to fix those as well. So that fed back into the thesis in ways, but also I'll share some of that in, in, in this presentation also. So table of contents. So here's the things I'll be looking at. Just arcade materiality, what do I mean by that? So kind of looking at how the arcade um, as a platform, as a genre, as a space um, moves from the physical world to the digital world and back again then when people you know consult on different online digital archives and use those to you know fix and repair and reconstitute the arcade in the real world. I'll talk a little bit about a project I made called VR Supergun, which is an attempt at trying to find a halfway point, sort of a happy medium between emulation and the aura of the real, experience in the real thing. And yeah, finally, the second last section was just briefly about experience versus authenticity, something that's been touched on in previous talks already. And I'll wrap up with some conclusions and questions. Probably more questions than conclusions, but that's the structure. So. Like, as far as, you know, different ways that we see um, arcade games being preserved in digital space, like, I'll, I'll look at a few different examples here. This is the industry itself sort of building its own, own um, archives, own digital archives. We actually can experience more than just the actual game within the, the space of the, of the screen. So, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this particular example. It was Namco Museum, brought out in 1995 for the... PlayStation 1, and in it you have this front end which is a kind of a, a first person perspective um, museum, virtual museum. So you walk around this museum and it's in this like big grand atrium and you go to the opening part and then you branch off into different games. And you can see a kind of a low res polygon 3D version of the arcade cabinet. You can also walk around, you can look at flyers, you can look at even like a, a reproduction of the um, the PCB of the of the circuit board. So you know one of the things that got me interested in looking at arcade games as as a as a platform to study was really you know this idea that that would just seem like a black box that there's like what is the computer that's inside and you know as I as I went through you find out well there's a lot it's a big family of platforms it's it's quite broad but yeah I mean. Um, I think having this kind of um, material information like hidden into a mainstream or as part of a mainstream title is a really great initiative by the manufacturers themselves to preserve, preserve their work and again like outside of the, the space and screen. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with this as well. Um, so Sega 3D Classics was a compilation that was released for the um, Nintendo 3DS in 2015. And M2, um, they were the developers in Japan, and so their task was to bring these games across to the. Well, they, they actually they they work on a number of different um, ports and conversions across from from the arcade to the home platforms. Now, they really 
I suppose, like, you know, there is that kind of what, what's the difference between like, a port and a version. Like, they try as much as possible to do it as a port, like, the, the lock, stock, and barrel bring the original code over. They'll have it embedded into a custom emulator, but then they'll make little tweaks and changes depending on the, on the platform that's there. But they'll also, you know, kind of have these added value and extra features. So, for example, for Thunderblade, they wanted to recreate the actual shell of the arcade. And also, because of the way that 3DS can deliver a, you know, a, a 3D depth of field, they're able to, you know, kind of give you that feeling that yeah, you've got the screen up in front of you, but you've also got the environment around you, and you've got a really interesting sense of movement and space when this is experienced. And then too, yeah, there's actually an excellent um, documentary on YouTube I really recommend checking out about their work, where they go very in depth into their process. Um, so, like both of those are ways of bringing the actual you know physicality of the arcade into digital space, and then you know just like the actual again kind of blurring between the, the digital and the physical. Um, Caps off is a community-led initiative for archiving or basically for cracking copy protection on rare arcade games. So you know, as is a, a kind of recurring topic through this conference, you know. Uh, um, g game platforms in general, they you know, they're subject to wear and tear, they're, and they become increasingly rare. Like back when they, when they were plentiful, um, like say the 80s and 90s, those platforms when, when the arcade operators st stopped making money off them, you know, they generally just threw them out. I was talking to an arcade operator from Donegal in the northwest of Ireland, and he was talking about like. It's family business, like yeah, they just at one point they just like you know dug a hole and got a JCB and it's very sad, but yeah, they demolished a whole bunch of machines and just went into a hole and got covered up, and that's that's how it goes. But um, yeah, the remaining specimens, sometimes it's necessary to do a bit of um of surgery on them in order for the you know the greater good. So that's where caps off comes in. So basically, what they do is they'll take these copy protected chips of acid etch the top of them off. And then zoom in very close with specialized microscope. They'll, and you can actually, and this is the par part when I saw this first, it's just amazing. Um, you can actually physically see the ones and zeros encoded into the chip. And then what they do is they have, they crowdsource it out to the community who transcribe it through these, um, through these, like it's like a capture, you know, are you a robot? except that you have to fill in the ones and zeros for the code. So everyone does this, or large amounts of people do this, and yeah, you've got, your, you've got your code that can then be used, can be put onto another chip, and used to kind of you know, bring that game PCB back from the dead. And so it shows like, you know, again, what the kind of the, the community, the, the arcade collector communities and arcade enthusiasts um, can do, you know, put their heads together. Another great example, and a really interesting community to check out are UK VAC, the, UK Vintage Arcade Collectors um, Forum, and they are, you know, big time enthusiasts and collectors and archivists of arcade games. And it's also just, you know, even seeing the stories they have about going on arcade raids, sort of here somewhere. Normally, it could be anywhere in Europe. They'll hear there's arcade machines in a warehouse or in a in a barn or propping up the roof of a, of, of some of some building and they'll organize and go there and try and negotiate and haggle and find out how they can buy these and yeah, and bring them back then um, to you know, be used in an arcade space. But Sega's, Sega had this motor drive in some of their games that are basically, if you're familiar with like you know, Space Harrier, Outrun, um, and a number of the different Sega games that were designed by Yu Suzuki, they had um, different versions depending on, you know, I guess the price point and also, you know, for just to cater for different audiences. So there were the deluxe sit-down versions, say, of Space Harrier that I had pictured here, and Outrun. And they were actually had hydraulics in them, so when you're playing the game, you know, it would move you around. But the actual motor boards, prohibitively expensive and very rare. So what happened was, some electronics engineers who hang out on the UK VAC forum, they got together and they they cloned the board and you know put together a limited uh, run and released it actually the plan is completely free to anybody else who wants it as well. So yeah, they just they funded they built it themselves, they funded it themselves and they made it, you know, they made it happen themselves. So again, this is like kind of a really 
useful, a really important and a necessary um, piece of kit. And again, where there's a will, there's a way. So they made it happen. And then, so that actually just like, like replicates the functionality of an original um, piece. And then you have, you know, these kind of little um, additions and add-ons as well. So you can get high <coughs> score kits, and there's a basically it's it's a replacement of a RAM. A, memory chip except this version when you switch off the power the information on it won't disappear so these are um, it's, it's often like it's it's informally called the Dallas chip mod so it uses a chip called Dallas DS122080 but it's it's and it's called NVRAM so non-volatile RAM so basically when you s play your game and got your high score it's on it and when you switch off the machine it won't disappear like the original so really great innovation. And even the little PCB, so the chip, like obviously it's made by that company, Dallas, and then you can see there's kind of a little green PCB, adapter PCB, so again, that was made by some people on the UK VAC forum to adapt that chip, but that Dallas chip mod is used, you know, in, um, it, it has been used before, and it's, it's used, it's been adapted by, used by other people in their projects as well. So, again, so kind of looking at, you know, actually extending and fixing um, the arcade um, platform. And then also, yeah, just trying to reproduce the environment of the arcade is just another area that kind of came up in my, in my research. So <coughs> on one side here, you've got, um, on the left-hand side, we have new retro neon arcade by Digital Cyber Cherries, and that came out in 2015. And that's really, it's a front end for me. So it allows you to play your main ROMs through a very um, highly detailed reproduction, perhaps like a really idealized reproduction or idealized vision of an 80s arcade, even named the whole neon and, and um, kind of suggests that, you know, that you've got that kind of um, vaporwave kind of um, new retro type resurgence type of vibe going on. And then on the right, we have, um, MEVR, which is another um, main shell in VR space. And what's interesting about it is, is, you know, like one of the kind of arguments against like VR and these kind of um, geographic type of user interfaces we have to walk around is, you know, the add layers of complexity there. You know, you have to walk around, that takes effort. You got to wave your arms around, that takes effort. And MEVR just embraces that. So it, um, you actually have to plug in the wires, you have to hook up the consoles, you can play a two-player game with someone in VR space, and when it's their turn, you pass the controller over to them. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's just taking, it's really, it's all about the environment. The ROMs themselves, I mean, they can't distribute the ROMs, so you know, that big disclaimer stuff about that. But, um, so, yeah, I mean, again, it's a really interesting, vision of, of, of view of where things can keep moving. So I'm going to skip on now a little bit to my, my project itself and you might see the influences in there um, for it. So before I talk about what a super gun is, I need to talk about what, uh, of what a VR super gun is, I need to talk about what a regular super gun is. So a super gun is basically the wiring of an arcade cabinet in compact form that basically allows you to plug and game, an arcade game PCB into it, in the same kind of manner you plug a games cartridge into a games console and then play it on a, on a TV set and with your own custom controllers or off-the-shelf controllers. The super guns, they use a pin standard called the JAMA standard that was introduced by the Japanese um, Arcade and Amusement Association or the JAMA um, Consortium in 1985 and that you know, brought in a 56 pin standard and a voltage standard and it basically before that you had a lot of different um, pin configurations for arcade games so this was introduced as a cost saving measure for the amusement operators that if they were to you know they could swap just the game instead of having to swap the whole cartridge it took the act the manufacturers maybe a year or two to all catch up and to standardize but it got there and it's kind of like you know where it's at the present day, it's still around. Even though they introduced sequels to it that were more technically advanced, it's like the way that DVD is still about. It's still around, even though Blu-ray was introduced as an alternative. So there's a couple of examples. The one 
On the left is Supergun Max Strike by um, Arcade Forge in Germany. And then on the right you have the Arcade Supergun um, programming system by Retro Electronic in France. So they both basically do the same thing. They allow you to hook up your games to a TV set and play away with your Neo Geo cusps, um, standard controllers, or just by connecting buttons and joysticks in directly to the terminal points. Okay, so when I was going for this project, there were a few things I wanted to bear in mind. So I wanted to keep it like, the idea is that of the project is really to allow you to, you have the super gun, allows you to play your arcade game, your TV, but the VR super gun allows you to play physical arcade game, but through a virtual VR shell. So it, re it gives you that kind of 3D arcade environment, but the game that you're playing is actually served up from the actual hardware. And also, it allows you to connect over network connection to this game. So the things when I was looking at the early stages and trying to figure out like how would this actually work was I wanted low, as low latency as possible, and also want to keep the cost of it down. Um, so it was done with a minimal kind as a, um, um, a setup as possible, and partly because of my own um, 3D kind of limits but also because it was appropriate to the era of games that, it, it, that I was studying, I kept the graphics in a low polygon style um, that would, you know, wouldn't look completely out of place in the mid 80s or 80s or 90s. And like I said, it's network, available, network enabled, and again, we'll try to use free and open source software where it was at all possible. The 3D side of it was done through A-Frame, which is a, basically it's a web VR framework it makes working in web VR very accessible. If you've done any HTML design, you know, you'd be familiar with positioning an image in X and Y space. It'll allow you to position your 3D object in X, Y, and Z space. So you have basically it's like a 3D um, website um, system. And yeah, again, this is the kind of look I was going for. This kind of hard polygon virtual fighter look. I used plans that were on classic arcade cabinets. Um, this archive site where they, you know, scanned in and drawn up CAD plans for arcade games that you can, you know, take to. If you're somebody who's very handy with woodwork, you can, you can reproduce them. I use this plan here for the Dynamo HS1 cabinet, and it's interesting. They have a system for accuracy. According to their site, this is 86 percent accurate. Um, and then the actual 3D modeling was done like as low polygon as possible using Milkshape 3D, which is a tool from the late 90s that was introduced for doing Quake and Counter-Strike models. And also then I used Magic of Voxel near the end, which is a very fast way of doing voxel art, so 3D pixel art. And yeah, uh, what I might do now is I've got a one minute trailer, which kind of takes you through it. Oh, that's not it, hold on. Here we go. And then I'll conclude. <coughs> we sound. So when, I'm working on, when I was working on this project, I just took little videos and screen cap grabs as it was going. And this is what you see from here. about that A-frame platform is you don't actually need a VR headset to use it. You can also view it on a regular computer screen in flat 3D, which makes, again, the project accessible, easy for people to use and to share. Also, a kind of part, part I didn't mention was, you know, trying to, it's put there as a prototype of a way to document the inside of what's going on inside the black box of the arcade as well. And yeah, I can chat a bit more about how the nuts and bolts will work with you after all, later on, if you like. Just quickly, a couple of things to wrap up. Earlier on, 
Melanie was talking about imaging of the um, discs for the Andy Warhol collection, but when they put this out into um, museum space, they had the challenge of having an Amiga um, computer that would last, you know, got lots and lots of people using it. So basically what they had to do was kind of find, again, this kind of halfway solution. So they used a shell of an Amiga, but they put a PC innards into it. But one particular innovation that they came up with, which would be applicable to, you know, games preservation and, and game arcade preservation, would be that they crafted a custom lens to go over the front of a CRT screen. So that's, they've got the flat screen inside the shell of a of an old CRT monitor, then they've got the special lens in front of it. So you have that along with the scanline effect of, you know, that can be done through emulation. You get something that's extremely close and tangible feels, you know, gives that feel, that look and feel. So yeah, just to, to wrap things up, you know, when I was talking about trying to, that's my Pac-Man that's not working at the minute, but eventually we'll get it there, hopefully. And, you know, I was talking to a friend about this project, saying, you know, be careful, you know, what you do with you, you ruined the patina. So you know we talk about like with furniture repair, even like you know these shows you see people re repairing cars. They'll take a kind of Discovery Channel, they'll take a an old rusted um, car, and next thing it's like immaculate and everything's been chromed up and looks good. I mean, what are the kind of you know limits that people should go to with this, or where where do you draw the boundaries? Um, so Miroslav beforehand, I thought it was that quote was great about like you know going you know, the guy going to the pinball museum saying he went to the pinball museum and. The paint, or you went into the art museum and the paintings are covered up, it would be a real shame. You know, being able to actually play these things is important, but also trying to keep the, the originals intact, you know, is important as well for, for, yeah, for the kind of, a, from a social point of view, just for, you know, for preserving the history and also for, for studying to, to learn from them. So, yeah, it's a broad question. I don't have a direct answer for that, but I guess it's about trying to, you know, try and find a happy medium there and definitely the play, keeping them open and accessible for play is, as, is very, very important. So, yeah, I think time-wise, maybe not the end of it, I'll wrap it up at that. Thanks very much, folks. Okay. So, thanks very much. Um, maybe I didn't get the point right. But my question is, so um, do I assume right that um, only one player can view um, um, it uh, once um, your system which you have prototyped? So then I wonder, or, or so multiple, more than one person could use it or view it. It's not, at the minute, the way it works is, it's basically a 3D website, so anyone could be them. Several people looking in on one gameplay session. Yeah, but, but can they, they play um, um, different games parallel? Because um, it's all going to yeah. one super gun hardware. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, so it's just like one system. I need multiple systems and some kind of portal. All right. Yeah. So then my question is, um, of course, you, you, you can all play these um, arcade games via the main emulator. Mm -hmm. And we're in combination with um, systems like uh, the emulation as a service, yeah. you can allow, you, you can scale that up to an infinite number of, of people playing one game in parallel in different sessions. So, what is the, why, why do you um, decide to, 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 to use the Supergun hardware yeah. part, which is limiting yeah. um, um, the, 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 the number of, of players? Who can play this game uh, in parallel? No, that's 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 a fair question. It's a good question. I mean, one reason would be that, as you know, with, with main emulation, there's sometimes there's some parts, the analog parts of the games that can't be. They can, you know, it, it might have had an analog sound chip that was, you know, producing the sounds from the chip, but then when they bring it into main, they sample the sound. So it's close, but it's not exactly the same. It's a little bit for, I suppose, like the purest market, I mean, like somebody might be like, yeah, I want to have that original first edition book or the first pressing of that vinyl, so. So it's accuracy, let's yeah, read it. It's while. accuracy, and again, like some people would value that experience more than others, I mean, like, you know, if playing the game, it might not really matter, but it's just, it could be a way as well of sharing rare PCBs between collections or, like, you know, remotely allowing access to them. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? are just starving. <laughs> okay then, thank you.
you very much, okay. Kieran. Yeah. Thanks very much, folks. Appreciate it.